Your Creative Push, episode 325. I wanted to get at something more than just complaining about this thing that had happened. I wanted more invention. I wanted more imagination. I wanted more. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Elisa Kennedy Jones. Elisa is an American memoirist, blogger, novelist, and public speaker. She's also a regular contributor to NPR. She has a popular blog called Gotham Girl, and her new book is called Gotham Girl Interrupted My Misadventures in Motherhood, Love, and Epilepsy. And she comes on the show today to talk about that book, her journey in writing that book, and also her journey with epilepsy. She shares the story of her first seizure and then being diagnosed with epilepsy, how our brain's function is to tell a story, and when it's time to move past the denial stage. She also talks about dealing with the ultimate imposter syndrome of not recognizing yourself in the mirror and the importance of making room for neurodiversity in our world, and why that was a major reason for her writing Gotham Girl Interrupted. And in terms of the book, she talks about the differences between writing a book and writing for television, and how she had to push to express how she was feeling right to the edge in her writing. She also shares how she gets past some of her resistances, how boredom can actually be useful, what she learned in television and film, that nothing is precious, and the lesson that she learned from improv acting, yes and. And finally, uh, one of my favorite parts of this episode, she talks about neuroplasticity and how it helped her to find her words again and how it can help you to learn new things. I had a great time reading Elisa's new book. Um, I learned a lot from it, and then I had such a fun time talking to her um, about the book and about her creative life and about what it's like to live with epilepsy. So please sit back and enjoy my conversation with Elisa Kennedy Jones. Elisa, welcome to your creative push. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I read your book. It is both eye opening um, to to see the um, the struggles, the triumphs, everything that that kind of goes behind um, epilepsy, but also it was just like fun, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like you have such a, a great way of of writing and explaining um, what you're going through, what you went through um, in a way that's, and, I, and you talk about this in the book too, how um, it's not necessarily all doom and gloom if you are epileptic. And that's sometimes the narrative that a lot of people kind of see. And uh, you just very effectively um, reach that goal of turning it into this thing that, yes, while it may have its struggles, um, is something that can be lived with and uh, lived with in a profound way. Oh, my God. You're so great at saying what I can't say. <laughs> oh. Well, you, you say it very well in the book. so. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's tricky business. But thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Um, Seriously. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. I always like to give my guests the opportunity at the beginning to sh kind of share how you got to the point you are today, um, creatively speaking, and also personally. Uh, okay, so long story short, I, 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 I'm just a regular girl who uh, grew up, went to NYU for film studies, came back, was working in Los Angeles. Um, which is why the title of the, of the book is, uh, uh, is kind of like, ah. but, um, I was on my way to my best life. I was already on my way. Uh, when at age 40, I was diagnosed with epilepsy and it was something that I did not expect. Uh, I was doing all the things that you you do to be a healthy person in the world. I was living in Los Angeles, working as a TV writer on my way to the television Academy with uh, my youngest daughter and her friend to see Nanny McPhee. When I had a major seizure, I had no idea what a seizure was. 
at that point in time. I didn't even know I was having one. And um, I'd been working in television and film and uh, theater for about 10 years at that point. And so it was, I don't know, it was a unique experience in that you can be doing all the things that you're doing uh, in the way that you think you are the most creative. And then suddenly the world rushes in to tell you, yeah, you have some more thinking to to do. So um, that's where I had come to when I had the first seizure. And I know this isn't a medical type of podcast. This is a creative podcast. But I guess I was coming home from Starbucks in my car and we had this ridiculous car. It was a 1985 Mercedes-Benz station wagon. It was our dog car. It was the dog car. <laughs> it's the car that the dog climbs into and you don't care. It's all good. Yeah. Everything is fine. I, you're like, ah, oh, I got nothing to complain about ever. And so I'm driving home in the dog car and I suddenly see well, I mean, we all have this. We all have like two projectors in our heads uh, in terms of our vision and the way that we see the world. And most of the time, that's all uh, uh, combined and uh, 3D. And for me, what happened was in this on this Saturday morning was uh, I had one projector going forward at a very rapid rate. And another projector in my right eye going in reverse, uh, so rewinding at a very rapid rate. And I'm driving in Los Angeles and thinking, oh, my goodness, what Donnie Darko movie is this? This is <laughs> yeah. nuts. And so I, I'm on like a side street, so it's not like a major thoroughfare. Uh, but And I'm five that like feet from my house, but I'm like, Oh, this is not right. This is like, Whoa. And I'm trying to reconcile both sets of vision, one going forward and one going back. And there was just no way to, to do it. And so what I, I mean, I, I, you know, eventually people are like honking at me and saying, ah, what and <laughs> mm -hmm. uh i you know i get to our house and at five miles an hour in the driveway and um my editor always wants me to say and the world melted away and i'm like that's not at all what happened uh, what happened was it was like a like a polanski and i know he's verboten right now but I, and he'll be verboten for forever but it was like this moment of like the world tilting and then suddenly i was in this lightning storm in my head and i kept trying to say it and say it and say it and i couldn't say it but what was happening around me was essentially oh my gosh she's you know dying hmm. and i was actually in a kind of space of oh wow this is the best lightning storm i've ever seen it's a complete lightning starry it's like being trapped in a van gogh painting for an extended period of time and so it was very ecstatic in its way but at the same time i could tell there was like complete and utter like navy blue authority going on <laughs> around mm -hmm. me and <laughs> EMS people and firefighters and all of this stuff B because I was having a seizure. And I, I just remember waking up in the hospital later to my girlfriend, who's a costume designer, Emmy award winning, amazing costume designer for film and TV saying, darling, Darling, you had a seizure and going, oh, I don't know what that, wait, what, what, mm. what's that? And I really didn't, I mean, I, it shook me 
uh, but my strategy coming home from the hospital looking like a prize fighter because I'd fallen in the kitchen against granite and other things, uh, I was really hurt and I didn't understand it. But in terms of creative push and creative pushing, it really didn't start then. It didn't start in that way. I was still busy trying to figure out, wait, I knew that seizures and epilepsy, and I wasn't diagnosed in the hospital at that point in time. It was just go home, take these anti-epileptic medicines and follow up with a neurologist. Right. And like, and like you say in the book, you thought it was just like a one time thing that you, that happened to you. I thought it was a one off. I was like, Oh yeah. man, I have to be, I don't know, better. Uh, <laughs> and I am not better most of the time. Um, mm. I was thinking about, I mean, it's so, it's so great. I, you know, when people actually do read the book, <laughs> because um, my first strategy was denial. I have to figure out a way to get my brain around this, whatever this is, because what I knew of seizures at that point in time was that they signaled something really severe, something very dramatic, like a brain tumor or you know, cancer or you know, something just horrific my i didn't even go to the place of epilepsy i didn't go there i couldn't it was too a i didn't know enough of, about it at that point in time and b I, I just i i couldn't do that because i i was a mother i was the one who was supposed to be a grown up and manage everything and so I just, I waited, I paused big time and I fermented on it. And again, as part of the creative process, because I'd always been in the writer's room working on different things. And one of the things that you learn in television or in film is that nothing is precious. And you have to learn to compromise and improvise in the moment. And you're building off your partners, uh, like your writing partners, your, your different people, like w what they're thinking. And yeah, you, it, it can go all kinds of different ways. But I guess for me, in this moment, it was like, I'm in a need to improvise in mm. a significant way, in a kind of Del Close kind of way of what are the rules of improv? Yes, and, and, you know, finding the agreement and not, you know, not going to the place of bow that can't work and staying entrenched in my views. That was one of my first responses to this seizure. Yeah, and I think that, you know, so often life throws us that that thing, you know, we're down, we're going down a path, um, everything's going great. And then boom, you know, you lose your job or so, something medically happens to you or somebody passes away or uh, any number of things. And um, that is the best way for <laughs> to deal with that as hard as it may be is that that improv mentality of yes, and like, okay, this happened. And D denial is fun for a little while, <laughs> but at some point you, you have to realize that life needs to go on and you need to figure out which kind of direction to take it. Exactly. And so denial works until your head is really hurting because it feels mm. like there's this like wire being tightened around it and you're like, ah, okay. So this could be a thing. This could app, this could be a thing. And I need to actually, follow up and do all the things. But I do think like with every TV show or every film, I mean, what is it that Forrester would always say? Um, great fiction or, and nonfiction <laughs> at times, um, someone comes to visit or someone takes a trip, the result of which something changes. So for me, it was, holy moly. Oh, I just had this, experience in my kitchen 
and I have scared my children in an intense way. And so what that set me on was I need to investigate this a la Nancy Drew, but also because I've written, I mean, I've spent my life writing mysteries and thrillers and whatnot, but I just, I'm like, I have to figure out what happened and I have to know all, I have to know these things. And at the same time, I have to do the improv thing, which is like, okay, so we're going to life is beautiful this for a moment <laughs> and until I can get actually into the doctors to get to the bottom of this. And oftentimes, oftentimes it takes a while to get to the bottom of these kinds of things because, I mean, that's the thing about the brain. I had given this TED talk on the brain's ultimate job, which I, I still believe this is true, which is to tell a story, whether it's to your big toe or, you know, to your hand to write something or to see something or paint something. That's our brain's job. But I mean, in this moment, it was about solving the immediate moment and figuring out, okay, here's, you know, how am I going to deal with things, very specific, very like boring, mundane things like driving. You're not allowed to drive if you're epileptic in when you're first diagnosed. You're not allowed to swim. You can't take a shower by yourself, which can be good or bad, but um, <laughs> there are all kinds of things that crop up that you're like, oh man, are you kidding me? I have to be able to cook. I am the person who makes dinner. Um, but then there's also the creative side of things, which um, I'd experienced early on because I recognized my seizure in a way. Um, because as I write about in the book, I had, you know, grown up in Northern California with back to the land, hippie parents who, you know, were like, yeah, be free. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, touched an electric fence at the age of four. <laughs> yeah. but, and this is a kind of thing I was like, oh, I recognize this. I recognize this, this kind of electric experience. Because after I came home from my first seizure from the hospital, I was like, oh, man, I had to do stuff. I had to write. I had to. I was fermenting on all kinds of ideas that I, it was like waking up with a, it was the ultimate reboot in a way. It was like waking up with a new brain. My words were off kilter. I'll give you that. Yeah. And that, that's something I wanted to ask you about too, because I like, for me, I'm a very slow writer and it takes me sometimes like a minute to think of the right word, or I have to <laughs> like look in the th thesaurus for like a word that's kind of like that perfect word that I know exists uh, somewhere in the back of my brain. Like it, but it's this specific word that I want to write down, but I have to like go on a journey sometimes to, to find that specific word. And I'm such a perfectionist that no other word will suffice. Um, and you talk about in your book, um, how difficult that was for you when you have the word in your brain, but you can't speak it. Um, and I was wondering how that affected your, your writing as well. Like, was it a slow process, frustrating process or, um, what, did, did you find that to be easier than speaking the words? I do think I process a lot, um, out loud and like yammer on forever. But what happened to me with this book is I was fermenting it from like 2011 until about 2014, because there's a kind of narrative messiness to chronic illness and that's what I think epilepsy is. That's how I see it. I see it as this chronic thing that you're going to have like a seizure after a seizure after a seizure. At a certain point, your body learns to have seizures, which is weird and mm. not right and really a bummer uh, for me in particular. 
and for a lot of people, for 65 million people. But uh, my process was fermenting, fermenting on all these stories of waking up from seizures in these different types, in these different circumstances, whether I was at work, whether I was at home, whether I was with friends and my close friends, that sort of tribe that you build up, they were like, okay, so this was a good one. This was only like two minutes. It wasn't 20. This is exactly, this is a good, this is like a step. But I've also woken up to like hippies in Muppet sweaters in Northern California going, dude, you need some weed. <laughs> and then I've woken up to an evangelical Uber driver who, in New York who was like, oh, you know, trying to save me. And I'm like, I'm saved. I'm, I'll try to be saved. I'm, I don't know if I can be saved. <laughs> um, but you wake up in all these bizarre circumstances. I woke up to a group of video gamers uh, at Electronic Arts, and and they were amazing, and they saved me. Uh, uh, and I totally inconvenienced them, but I really, I just, I mean, I kept working at EA, and I really love that time because it was a very creative place. And then it was a, a lot about play. But for me, it was the fermenting of what was happening to me from about 2011 to 2015 when I woke up in the grocery store and who knew everything would always happen in the grocery store. <laughs> um, but it does. And I, I know, uh, you know, I woke up to essentially Milo Ventimiglia over me and from This Is Us going and going, oh my, oh my God, what's happening? What is this? And um, thinking, oh God, did I just get brain on Milo Ventimiglia or, you know, <laughs> This Is Us Jack kind of guy or oh, I don't want to get brain on anyone, tr really, truly. Uh, but, uh, and waking up with my face broken in 16 places and not being able to talk for a long time, about a year. And that being a uh, kind of space, that making space in my life uh, to think about all the different ways that I would come at this kind of condition, which I see as. Yeah, I mean, I want to end epilepsy and seizures like immediately for all the people who suffer. And I know that there are 40 different types of seizures. But for me, what happens at the end of every seizure is that I feel I've got this like blank slate and that lets me write things and do things that and mess up things <laughs> mm -hmm. um which i did a lot of with language uh at the beginning because uh, i would go to say like i'll put that i'd go to say the word i don't know whatever garage and it would come out yard garbage and then finally garage and that was really alarming but at the same time it was really interesting i was like ah oh, so this is how i work you know i'd go to try to say put the day uh, to tell one of my daughters yeah, put that thing in the thing in the dish the thing that we put all the things in before they go into the dishwasher and <laughs> she'd be like a, you mean a sink and I'd be like oh that's not a word <laughs> no, no way so there are these little kinds of moments that are instructive I think when it comes to thinking about living with a long-term condition and, you know, breaking my face in 16 places was a moment when I, you know, where I wasn't going to be able to talk for a long time, but that made space for me to actually think about all the ways that I would come at an illness or in a condition like this and not make it into a kind of misery memoir which I think is very common in 
and not that people aren't miserable, <laughs> but I wanted to change what I saw when I was diagnosed. Was I looked around and I saw a lot of heavy duty suffering and alienation and isolation. And what I wanted for this particular project was to change the way that people talked about epilepsy and talked creatively about a lot of chronic conditions, whether it's mental health issues or Alzheimer's or, I mean, we're, everybody's got something. And I'm not saying you should be the confessional person. It, I, that definitely is not me. Ex but at the same time, I just, I wanted to get at something more than just complaining about this thing that had happened. I wanted more invention. I wanted more imagination. I wanted more. And you know, I know it's it's sometimes for me very hard to be vulnerable or to open up um, about something that, you know, obviously you have no control over, you know, what happens to your body. Um, I know, and, and yet you get, hey, this, <laughs> you should be ashamed of it. So I was, right. I was so naive. I was like, wait a minute, I should be ashamed of this thing that I have no control over? It's just <laughs> happening over and over again? And I'm supposed to be embarrassed. I'm sorry that I, I mean, I might be embarrassed about some, a lot of things, but this is not one of them. Hello. Right. Well, was it, was it hard for you to open up about, um, you know, things like that, but also, um, you're, you're very honest about the, the emotions that you went through, like feelings of guilt and stuff like that. So was it, was it hard for you in the process of kind of putting this book together um, and putting all the all of these stories together, and as you said, it it can be messy uh, when you have a chronic illness. Um, but w did you find it difficult to be as vulnerable and honest as possible, yet still trying to uh, be humorous, but also still trying to give it justice? Yeah, I I'll be honest. I didn't know how to do this because I never want anyone suffering to like feel diminished by my snarky mode of being. But um, I did have difficulty getting to the emotion. And that was one of the notes that I got from my editor along the way. And really, in, when you're writing a book, it's very different from television because you might write something, rewrite things over and over and over again, a dozen times to get to where it needs to be ready and it's ready to shoot. Um, but with a book, you really only get one content kind of edit and then a copy edit. And one of the notes, uh, or not one, many of the notes <laughs> that I got in this process was, but wait, what are you feeling? what are you feeling? What are you feeling in this moment? And that requires you to go to, and that's why I think it's really hard to write essays and memoirs and to go to that place of absolute fear. Um, and it may not be absolute fear. I mean, all of that is relative, but um, where you're writing right to your edge of like, ah, you know what? I am not going to, I mean, I'm still physically and uh, facially disfigured from this, this seizure in 2015. And I've had six surgeries and gone through this really lengthy period of trying to learn how to talk again and express again. And I've got like this, like rest you know, what, it, whatever it's called. What is it? What is it? Uh, it's not resting brow bitch, but, um, what is resting it? bitch face? Yes. I've got <laughs> rest. I've got, <laughs> I've got one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like, I've got resisting bitch face or, or resisting bitch brow or something along those lines. I mean, I call it resting. I, I at one point was like resting freak face because people in my <laughs> building did not recognize me. And I'm like, it's me. 
come on, come on, people. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a, it was a real challenge. And so, how do you? I'm not Proust. I'm not Dickens. I'm not a, any great Shakes writer. I'm good at pithy banter, mm-hmm. or I was. So my editor would say, you know, what were you actually feeling, and what like like we have to figure out a way to put the vulnerability in there uh, in like, or to capture that because it is very, you are very vulnerable when you are writing about something so personal and writing about really a, a, a big a pivot in your life. Um, because I didn't recognize myself for a good year and a half. I mean, talk about the ultimate imposter syndrome. Every time you walk by a mirror, you're like, who's that? Oh, no. That mm. And I, that was tricky. It's like to figure out me in the space of all of the space. And there's a lot of space when you have epilepsy. I think uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, material there but you don't want to mine your life for only like tragedy and i wanted to like take a look at how i could shift the conversation because i do see uh, a lifetime of being vulnerable but also being highly creative and producing work that is not about epilepsy I really think that our world is better for a space that allows for neurodiversity, meaning everyone is very differently wired in all kinds of ways. And instead of pathologizing, I mean, I think pathologizing, that's, you know, you're working toward medicine, you're working toward science, but at the same time, I want us to make room for all kinds of different brains. And so that was a big part of writing the book. And I, once I got through the initial first draft Ah, uh, which I, I know, I mean, every writer is different. Um, and I had a number of different influences in my life, but I pretty much wrote stream of consciousness for the first draft entirely. And I'm a, tw- I'm like a, I'm a tinkerer. Hmm. I tinker and tinker and tinker and I go back and I go back and till I'm ready. And then, with my editor, he was instrumental in helping me make sense of a story of epilepsy to the world in a way that was mainstream enough to hopefully connect with people who have no concept of epilepsy, just like me. Well, you you definitely did that. Um, and I was wondering how then, once you were able to get to that point in your final draft, um, where you're able to open up, how did that act as a catharsis to you? And what have you been experiencing now that the book's been out and you're on your book tour and meeting people um, who have read the book and the response that you've gotten from people? What has that whole process like kind of felt like? Oh, man, I could write a whole book on what that process <laughs> It's intense. I mean, because your book doesn't come out for a long time unless you're really special. I mean, you've got an 18-month cycle between what you write and is signed off on and what comes out. And with all the different types of people, you work. For, okay, so one story. You work forever on this book. You work for years and years and you're, it's like, oh, I've got to get this essay like crisp, like Davis, David Sedaris style. And I'm like still learning how to talk and doing all those things. I mean, I couldn't say any of the words correctly, but Mm -hmm. at the same time, there are all these people who start to weigh in on what your book should be. And so initially my editor was like, 
ah, oh, you know, you're not sad enough. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to write a misery memoir. So there's that bit. But then there are also people weighing in about titles. And so you've had in your mind the title of this thing that should be the thing that is your thing, that is you. And it's so interesting to see it all on the outside of your head. Uh, it's almost a relief uh, to be like, oh, okay. Whew. But at the same time, you have all these people weighing in with marketing data. And that is a challenge because I'm like, what algorithms are in charge of titles? I'm just not sure. And so, I mean, on the one hand, I had all these Ricky Lee Jones, Joni Mitchell kind of joyous moments of finally getting it out and getting uh, and getting it signed off and out the door. But on the other hand, all this like, will anyone actually like, will this book even find any kind of audience? And there's a lot in the epilepsy world that is hard and complicated. And I'm not saying my story isn't. It was and continues to be. I, I'm 93 days seizure free from the last seizure. Hmm. And before that, it had been almost three years. So that was kind of a hard thing. Like right like the night before my book was coming out to have a seizure and doing all the right things and taking all the meds on schedule and following all the rules and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's tricky. But I think when someone gets you, and gets your voice and gets your work. And you know you're always going to have to clean up your work more and more. And, and you're going to have to get cleaner and, and more economical in the way you deliver stuff. But it's truly, it's this joyous thing. And, you know, in the process of my, in the book coming out and uh, going around the country and meeting all kinds of people dealing with all kinds of different chronic conditions, whether it's epilepsy or mental health issues or addiction or uh, even Parkinson's. I mean, there people want to feel connected and they want to feel like their lives have meaning. And I certainly want to feel that way, but that is, like connecting with individuals on that level has been huge. What I have noticed is that a lot of people in the epilepsy community can't actually afford to, you know, buy books because um, they're struggling to afford their medications and they're struggling to afford different surgical options or insurance or the all kinds of things. So it's been really enlightening. At the same time, I've also discovered that neurologists all wear brightly colored bow ties and navy, navy blue jackets and dockers. And they are appealing to other scientists who may be bench scientists it, working in their own creative way to figure out how a rodent model of epilepsy translates to something that could be a cure or a, 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 a remedy for one of the 40 types of seizures um, in a human model. So it's been really interesting. I will tell you also that, you know, when you have a book that is colored purple, after you've worked on it for so many years and it's bright purple and you show up to your first book reading ever in your lifetime and a little girl five steals it off the table before you've even, you even you even sit down and runs away with it and you're like oh my god oh my god oh my god my book is full of swear words <gasps> oh. <laughs> Oh no, no. And you're shouting throughout the giant, like the cavernous Barnes Noble. You're like, no, 
no, that's PG-13. That's just like, it's done. Oh. And I mean, you will have moments like that on the right. tour and you will end up in, in situations where you're like, how did I get here? Oh my God. There are bigger bugs outside of Manhattan for sure. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, these are like small things, but at the same time, it's been really interesting to get to know America through a good old fashioned whistle stop, like book tour. Right. Yeah, it's definitely a, a unique opportunity, but you earned it. Uh, you earned the right to destroy the innocence of children all across the I'm country. I'm so, so sorry to that mother. I was just like, <laughs> oh, my God. And the people from the Epilepsy Foundation were like, oh, no. <laughs> no, it's fine. She already steals things, so no, you're no, good. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> the one, like, redeeming moment was that she did also pick up, like, Gretchen Rubin's book. And I think she's a really good I mean, uh, the happiness project. And I was like, you know what? We all deserve a little happy. <laughs> <laughs> She's got really good taste. <laughs> She's got some good taste. But I mean, I mean, at the, I mean, what are you going to do in the moment? I, I what are you going to do? You just have to, you have to go with it and be like, oh, 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 that's probably not the book for you, little kid. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what happens. It happens a lot. <laughs> I love it. Um, so one section of your book that I loved, um, it made me really hungry though, uh, was when you talked about pie, um, but specifically pie and, and how it kind of relates to neuroplasticity, which is like kind of a, a superpower of the brain that I, I just, I love talking about in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was wondering, could you talk about, um, that story and also, um, what can, what can people do for themselves to to make new neural connections by doing something new? Well, I mean, at the end of that chapter, spoiler alert, I'm like, you could probably do a lot of things that you haven't already done. For me, when I came home from the hospital, I noticed that my words were off significantly. And I also was floored at I just was like, what the heck just happened? And I retreat to food like a lot of us do. And oh, yeah. so, I mean, all I wanted was a, like a really cozy blanket of the food network and Ina Garten and Ina. Garten, I love Ina. She's so great. And I just wanted her, her <laughs> like warmth and, Jeffrey's away. Come over for lunch and let me take it. Like, let me just like make you feel a tiny bit better. But I mean, for me, what I noticed, the, I would go to do things that, um, obviously my sequencing was off, whether it was with language, but also like where I would go to in the kitchen, I would go to the wrong drawer to get the thing. And I, we do this all the time just as humans, but. I also like putting on clothes. I'm like, oh, okay, so uh, shirt, bra. <laughs> I was like, everything is wrong. I'm doing it out of order. And it was really just being uh, alone with myself in my house going, oh, I need to do things and uh, with my hands. And it was very gut level. Like I need something that gives me uh, like sequencing and that I'm working with my hands. And I had grown up with uh, a house full of cooks and chefs and people who made things. And for me, pie was the thing. I would rather have a pie over a birthday cake any day. And pies are labor intensive. They take a lot of work from every, you know, it, it's chemistry. And so, and you're following everything to the letter, or if you're improvising, you're taking your life into some kind of, yeah, risky place. <laughs> but um, for me, making pies and rolling out the dough and working with my hands, every time I did that, every day, because I was home from work and I was, trying to figure out what had just happened. And it was this natural comforting thing to be rolling out the dough, making 
a cherry, having to go through all the steps of making the cherry bourbon crumb pie and following all the directions and, and doing that over and over and over again. And it's this kind of, you know, we're knocked back by these things, which are mundane, but also shocking at times. And I needed the repetition of the ordinary uh, to help me get back to me, if that makes sense, to help me get back to language. And, oh, this is the word for that. And this is, and that's the place in the kitchen. And no, your bra goes on before your shirt. Don't do that. <laughs> um, you're not Tom Hanks. And so I, it's just like, there are these moments where I had to, uh, and it, <laughs> I had to play with my own brain of like, what's going to work here to get things back? What's going to work? And so making pies, whether it was a pear gruyere <laughs> or whether it was a cherry bourbon or whether it was just a very simple apple pie, farm made, it was working with my hands that made me feel better. And made me feel like I could connect certain dots in my head. And the truth of the matter is with neuroplasticity is it really is. It's so sophisticated and it's so special in that it's all relative in that if your brain isn't used to sword fighting and you've just had kind of a neurological event that was significant, you might take a fencing class. You might do anything that will make you feel like you stretch yourself just a tiny, tiny bit. I could have done anything. I could have just, I could have been knitting. I could have been doing any kind of hand related activity, but it's that kind of occupational work that actually really helped my speech uh, when I was coming back from things and also helped my writing. Sometimes you have to break everything to break through. Absolutely. Such a a powerful tool that I think a lot of times we, we fall into patterns and we just go about our everyday life. Um, and sometimes it, whether we're going through something or not, it's just nice to start something new, to learn something new and to just like get your brain, for lack of a better term, sparking and uh, kind of firing different synapses and, and trying to uh, reach its full potential. Yeah. I mean, and also, I mean, and I go back to the thing, like I'm a morning person. I write in the morning. I'm funny in the morning. I'm not funny at night. Um, <laughs> but well, you're um, funny tonight. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, um, I, I, I have my patterns and when you bump up against those patterns, that is an opportunity without sounding like inspiration porn or whatever to play around and tinker with your own creative process and the way that you make things. Again, I would tend to crank out writing and materials for the next deadline, but at the same time, you know, I've got my blog, which is essentially my sketchbook, where I'm just experimenting with all kinds of different things. And and you have to keep experimenting. You have to keep busting yourself out of your routines. Absolutely. I mean, that's the other thing that I thought about relative to your podcast is I, like, I know there are people who are against boredom, but I think so. Sometimes boredom can be real and anxiety and depression and all a lot of things. I think boredom can be really useful in that I was always just a wanderer around New York City. I, I walk and I walk and I walk and I can never not stumble upon some kind of story that's interesting, that's specific, that's singular in and of itself. And so I don't know. I don't want to underestimate boredom. Yeah. And to not be afraid to, to allow yourself to be bored too. Cause I think that with our cell phones and with technology, it's so easy to, 
um, once that inkling of boredom starts to creep creep in <laughs> like you can always find something to distract yourself to distract yourself away from that boredom um, and just allow yourself to um, be bored and see where that leads you as opposed to f filling it with distractions yeah i'm such a nerd but at the same time i can also flip it and say like thank god for cell phones for making it okay to have dinner by yourself on the book tour <laughs> right Right, for sure. Where you're like, thank goodness that I can just look down and feel occupied. Um, but I don't know that that necessarily makes all the art we want to make and we long to make. That it is a longing to make things. Absolutely. All right. Well, Elisa, it's time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, don't be afraid to write or speak to the edge of yourself, of your fears, of everything. I mean, people probably say that all the time, but... To actually sit down and do it and say, I'm going to say the thing that I can't say to myself, I can barely admit to myself, or, oh, it's really hard. And don't be afraid. This is the thing when you're writing something over the course of years that is big, that's like got many chapters. It's like, don't be afraid of the edit. The edit is the most painful part of making anything, uh, whether it's art or, uh, or write, uh, a novel, the edit hurts. And I'm not saying be a masochist, but I'm saying own the edit, like be there in it because you can realize some really amazing things. I mean, the edit means you kill certain aspects or ideas or words, but don't be precious. Just go. Don't be precious, just go. Uh, Alisa, thank you so much for for coming on the show, for sharing your journey, for writing an incredible book, uh, for letting me read it for free, <laughs> and, uh, and just for coming on and, and sharing your story today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I have to pee like a wild racehorse, but <laughs> oh my God, thank you for having me. Oh, of course. And for everybody listening, you can find Alisa on her website, which is alisajones.com. A L I S A J O N E S dot com. Uh, you can also find her on I am Gotham Girl dot com. That's the blog on Twitter. I am Gotham Girl, but we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, your creative push dot com slash Gotham Girl. Elisa, thanks again. Take care. My thanks to Elisa once again for coming on the show and sharing her story. Uh, two quick things from this episode the first being uh, that whole notion of improv acting. And the, the, the quote, yes, and. Now, I'm no psychologist, um, but I know that for me personally, um, I can very easily get caught up in the things that are going wrong, the things that happened yesterday or a month ago that were not good. My focus keeps drifting back to those either unfortunate events or untimely events or things that acted as a speed bump. But I have to remind myself that there's nothing you can do to change the past. All you can do is move forward and not let the the struggles of yesterday affect you today and affect you tomorrow. So when life throws you a curveball, even a huge curveball like having a seizure and being diagnosed with epilepsy, I just love Elisa's mentality of saying, yes, and, okay, what's next? Let's figure this thing out and let's move forward. And secondly, I could not agree more with Elisa about the importance of making room for neurodiversity in our world. And that's actually going to be somewhat of a theme this year uh, on your creative push to talk to different individuals, creative individuals that have used their creativity to help them either get through some kind of mental illness or incorporating a mental illness into their art. We're actually starting with that next week with Teresa Coulter. She's an artist from Canada who uses her art uh, to help her interpret the world and also for post-trauma growth. We really dig our teeth into um, different mental illnesses and how art can help you with them. 
but also help other people. But aside from that, we also get into tons of different things about creativity and the creative process, such as stopping creating art to go do a different job and then getting back into the field. Lots of great stuff. Um, and if you want to find out more about Teresa, you can head to her website, TeresaCoulter.com. That's C-O-U-L-T-E-R. On Instagram and Twitter, she is Teresa underscore Coulter. And we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 325. But that is all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. We'll be here for you next week. If you need that push again, continue to create wonderful things for this world. We need you to do that. So keep pumping it out. Keep sharing it with us and keep moving forward no matter what life throws at you. I love you all so much and we'll see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.